and this is Kelsey Cooper, and I'm the host for Disabled Birth Stories Podcast. I hope those in the disabled community can enjoy these stories of bringing beautiful babies into the world and the journey along the way. I hope this podcast helps you feel seen, heard, empowered, and capable, no matter your journey to being a parent. I hope those who are able-bodied would listen to empathize with and support their disabled family member, friend, acquaintance, or random stranger. Thank you for listening, and feel free to email me if you have any questions or would like to be featured on the podcast at disabledbirthstories at gmail.com. Thanks for joining us today. After listening to this episode, please remember to rate and review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Please also check the description for our social media links and the link to our merch store. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only and is not intended as medical advice. Please consult your medical providers for all of your healthcare needs. Also, the views and opinions expressed by the guests are not necessarily the views and opinions of the host and vice versa. Hi, I'm your host, Kelsey Cooper, and I'm here with Emily, and she's going to tell us her story today. Emily, can you start by introducing yourself? Hi, I'm Emily Pomroyd-Smith. You'll probably tell by my accent that I'm not from the US. I'm coming to you today from England and I live in the southwest of England with my husband and my six-year-old. And can you tell us a little bit about your disability and how it affects you? I have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which I think probably more people are becoming familiar with. I was diagnosed when I was in my mid-20s, but it's a genetic condition and you can see going throughout my entire medical history, you can see symptoms and how it was missed. Just from when I learned to walk, you know, um, being a small child as well as my parents were told that I had dropped arches because I walked flat footed and I kept spraining my ankles and I had problems with my knees and my back. And as a teenager, I was diagnosed with like lumbago with like reduced mobility in my lower back. And they were like, this is something that old people get. <laughs> And it progressively got worse until I was in my early 20s and I was in constant pain. And I went through three years of desperately trying to find out what was wrong with me and being made to feel like I was, you know, like being medically gaslit and being made to feel like it was all in my head until I saw Professor Graham, who Professor Rodney Graham in the UK is like the sort of the god of ehlers Danlos Syndrome. So he, I was diagnosed by him. Then all of the extra bits that go with EDS got diagnosed as well. So subsequently, I've been diagnosed with postural orthostatic cardia and mast cell activation syndrome and other bits and pieces. And now I'm in my 30s. So I'm in my mid-30s and I became a wheelchair user while I was pregnant. So that's quite an interesting sort of segue and a bit of the conversation we'll come to but I have chronic pain um, joint dislocations and subluxations um, fatigue lots of things that obviously make pregnancy and childbirth medically complicated as well but done that once and we won't be doing that again <laughs> so let's get right into how you found out you're pregnant firstly I think we sort of go back a little bit into the fact that my husband and I were together with childhood sweethearts we went to school together we've been married for 13 years this year nearly 20 years together so and my picture was always to have children like in my head everyone has a picture of what family means to them and for me it was having children and I always pictured myself as a mum we had this issue where my health was deteriorating and it was getting worse and we also found out obviously that I had a condition that was genetic and that could be passed on to any children that we had. So it took a few years for us to decide how to start a family and what we were going to do with that because we did consider alternative forms of having children. So we looked at surrogacy, we looked at adoption, we considered doing all of those things. Ultimately, it came down to deciding that I would still want to be here. And that I still have a good quality of life overall. I'm a happy, healthy, you know, relatively healthy person. If you take away the impact of being disabled on, you know, and the society's way that I'm treated and have to deal with those things, actually, you know, being disabled isn't a problem for me. You know, yes, there are challenges, but it's not always negative. It's actually part of the, you know, it's who I am. And that's a good thing. And I'm, I'm a nice person and I, I'm happy to be here. So we decided that we would at least give it a go and see what happened. We fell pregnant in the first month of trying. So it was, we are one of those annoying people that just sort of, you know, it happened straight away, but we didn't get much practice, which was a bit of a shame because, you know, the making babies part is fun. <laughs> the rest of it 
not so fun. I ended up being quite poorly throughout my pregnancy. So I had constant morning sickness. I wasn't actually physically sick. I was just constantly nauseous, which was horrible. But in terms of my disability, obviously there are hormones that are released during pregnancy. You get relaxing and everyone was excited and we were all very happy to be doing this, but we suddenly sort of realized that things were going to get a bit more complicated. My mum was concerned but excited about becoming a grandma. My son was their first grandchild, so that was really exciting. My husband is just a constant worrier and he just yeah, constantly checking if I'm okay. So there was a lot of cautiously doing things and making sure that I didn't sort of overdo things. But it was overall, the pregnancy itself up until the actual birth was really regular apart from obviously just being nauseous the whole time. But then I think morning sickness is named by men, isn't it? They, they say, because they're only there for when you're sick in the morning. They're not there for when you're sick for the rest of the day as well. <laughs> so, so I suppose that is quite normal. As far as getting care for pregnancy in the UK, what is that like compared to what you know about the US? Obviously, we have the NHS. And I cannot tell you how different that is to being in the US. I'm sure that, I mean, we I've seen copies of your hospital bills and things like that. And it just terrifies me, especially as a disabled person, because obviously I have no control over when or how often I need to use medical services. <laughs> so it's, it's quite scary. But what happens here is that immediately we have a big difference, I think, compared to the US is that most of our antenatal care and birthing care um, is carried out by midwives. Mm -hmm. So we don't use OBs and doctors when we're pregnant. We generally are cared for by midwives. And the same while you're giving birth, you're cared for by a midwife. And it's only if you have a complication or you require surgery or any of those sorts of things that you're under doctor care. So the majority of women in this country will be under midwife care. So it's slightly different to the US, I think, from, from watching a lot of Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> they're, they're a bit different. Um, and of course, it's free at the point of use. So I had no medical bills from being pregnant or from giving birth, none of that. Obviously, it's paid for. It's paid for via taxes and through national insurance, which everybody pays, but it's, you know, it's not anywhere near as terrifyingly <laughs> expensive as it is to have a child in the US, because I think just giving birth in a hospital costs you, you know, thousands of dollars. And it's like, <laughs> it's <Yeah>. scary, <laughs> especially if you have a poorly baby then as well. I mean, I don't even know how that works. Do you know if like the care with a midwife, if that changes, if you have a disability? So I was under consultant led care because of my disability. So I was deemed a high risk pregnancy because of my Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And I was only allowed to give birth in a hospital. We have a lot more home births here and we have birthing centers that are midwife led and you don't have a doctor in there at all. It's all led by midwives. And then if there's a complication, they will take you in an ambulance to the hospital. Again, you don't pay to go in an ambulance. That's all part of the <laughs> National Health Service. So I was under consultant care. However, when I say I was under consultant care, I had two appointments with a consultant during my whole pregnancy. The rest of it was all with my midwives. When we go through actually what happened when I gave birth, I didn't see a doctor for the whole time that I was giving birth. I saw I was looked after by midwives and they did a phenomenal job. So I know around the 20 week mark, we do the anatomy scan here in the US. What kind of scans or different things do y'all do? So it's exactly the same um, thing. So we have a 16 week scan that's just you know making sure confirmation basically so they don't do a anatomy scan until 20 weeks so they do the 20 week scan then depending on where you are that would probably be mostly it unless you're a higher risk pregnancy and they or are there are any issues and you won't have any further scans sometimes people will have scans if obviously positioning is questioned or if they think it might be back to back or breach or any of those sorts of things or if baby isn't growing properly or there's any issues with those sorts of things i had a few scans. I had an internal scan quite early on because I had some bleeding. And again, this is all just turn up and have it. I didn't... <laughs> yeah, I just was worried about bleeding. And so they checked me. Um, so I had an internal scan then. And then I had one at about 14 weeks and then one about 20. And then I had a further one because of my Ellis Damnos and just wanting to see where things were and how things were growing because he was quite big at that point. <laughs> 
<laughs> so they wanted to check that everything was okay. So 20 weeks, they will give you an idea of gender, if that's what you want to know. We didn't want to know. We wanted a surprise. We didn't find out until our son was born what he wants. And even then, I suppose you don't really know, do you? <laughs> You're right. I know in the US, around 12 weeks or so, sometimes 10 weeks, they do the... Um, chromosome blood test to check for down syndrome or other things like that do they do something similar there yeah so you can have amniocentesis i believe is what it's called the testing we opted out of the testing i think it was quite a it was an interesting discussion because they they like to push it they like to sort of you know especially because i was deemed a older parent older mother even though i was like 30 <laughs> so you know so it was something that they definitely were eager for us to have done but we opted out once they did the anatomy scan and that sort of stuff and they were happy with like the the length and all of those things like our risk was pretty low but also I think as a disabled person apart from obviously sometimes obviously knowing is a good thing so you can be prepared for things it wouldn't have changed anything for us and actually having the checks the checks that could put the baby at risk was something that we didn't want to do so we decided to opt out of those we had the ones where they actually like measure measure the fundal length and all of those sorts of things but they do that on the scan rather than so it's a non-invasive test so we did all the non-invasive ones not the (laughs) ones that were involved big needles so how does the end of pregnancy go obviously i had the issues that i was facing in terms of physical side effects of being pregnant became more of a problem when i was around sort of 28 to 30 weeks I had really bad SPD so my hips were dislocating while I was asleep so I'd wake up in the morning and I'd have hip in the wrong place and I'd have to like put it back in and I was in a lot of pain and it was really uncomfortable and it was at that point that we finally decided to get a wheelchair so that was something that I probably resisted for longer than I should have and not just because I should have had it before I was pregnant to be honest it was just it's one of those things I think that that internalized ableism that means that I, you know, having a wheelchair felt like I was giving up or, you know, any of those sorts of things. And then suddenly this mind shift happened where it was like, actually, this is not giving up. It's keeping going and making sure that I can keep going and having this safety net so that I'm looked after, but also the side effect of my husband not having to worry about me so much because... I'm not on my feet and I'm not overdoing it. And yeah, I'm not going to injure myself the same way. It was definitely an adjustment, but it was good. And I had my consultant appointment relatively late in my pregnancy. That is one of the issues with a national health service at the moment in the UK is that we have quite long waits for a lot of things. I was referred for physio at my first midwife appointment and I didn't get an appointment until after my son was born. (laughs) <laughs> there are long waits for a lot of things and if you don't have private health care there is private health care available here and um, that obviously is due to years of government choices and underfunding and lots of issues on those fronts so I only saw consultants when I think I was about 30 weeks one of the issues again I think with having something like ehlers danlos syndrome or something that's not as widely known about by medical professionals means that I have to be an expert in my own condition and I'm talking to someone who basically their view was well we'll just have to wait and see <laughs> which isn't particularly reassuring you know, when you're like I've got to bring this precious load into the world and I'd like your help please <laughs> um, but they you know they were very they were quite I suppose blase about it quite relaxed and very much like well we'll just have to wait and see what happens that turned out to be something that shouldn't really have happened because everything was progressing absolutely normally I was having a pretty standard pregnancy apart from my joint issues but nothing else was particularly problematic Logan was growing absolutely fine I wasn't having any problems with movement or any of those things and we got to just over 35 weeks so it's 35 weeks plus one it was a Saturday there was a really big storm because I was talking to my neighbor because fences had blown down I mean I say a big storm it's a big storm by our standards (laughs) you have much bigger storms in the US but yeah so it was you know I remember because we were talking about and she was like oh how are you doing and I was like oh I've got a week left of work and you know and then I'm taking two weeks holiday and then I'm going to start my maternity leave and I'm feeling a little bit fed up now and I'm getting to that point where I'm a bit heavy and a bit grumpy and it, it was February so it was cold and I had to be wrapped up but I was hot and I you know, couldn't regulate my temperature and it was all 
you know, it's just that miserable stage of, of pregnancy where you just want it to be done now. Mm -hmm. um, little did I know. <laughs> and I think that's, you know, and I had, and I said to her, you know, I had my appointment next week with my midwife to do my birth plan. So I hadn't done my birth plan at this point. I knew some of the things that I wanted. Um, so I don't know if you do a birth plan in the US or yeah. like a, an idea. So yeah, so it was basically, you know, like I wanted to avoid as much intervention as possible. But if they said I needed intervention, I'm like, give me the intervention. <laughs> um, I trust you. You're the experts. I'm not. Apart from that, that was pretty much it. But there were some medical things that needed to go in there, like the fact that I, Moko anesthetic doesn't work and that I would need silk sutures for stitches and things like that to related to having EDS. So, and that I bleed excessively. Uh, <laughs> and a few, a few other things that needed to sort of go in there for reference should they need it and that evening my husband drew me a bath and I went to the toilet and I wiped and there was blood and I called the midwives and they said you've got to go straight to the hospital because it's early you know you're obviously only 35 weeks you need to go straight to the hospital but also I was I wasn't allowed to have a midwife led birth at the birthing center because of being high risk I had to be at the hospital anyway so I went to the hospital at about nine o'clock on a Saturday evening, went straight into a birthing suite because they were so busy, got seen by the doctor, examined, definitely not in labor. So cervix high, long, closed, definitely not in labor, no contractions, nothing. And at one o'clock in the morning, they sent us home with the instruction from the doctor that I don't want to see you for another two weeks. <laughs> We want you to get to 37 weeks. And she also said, oh, I can sign you off work. And I was like, well, I've only got a week left. I can sign myself off work. <laughs> if I don't want to go in, I won't go in. That's one of the things that we do have a lot better in the UK as well. And we'll go on to that with maternity rights um, and maternity leave because I got paid maternity leave and so does everybody else, <laughs> um, <laughs> which is a big, big difference. So I went home, went to bed about one o'clock in the morning. And about half past four, five o'clock, I woke up and I thought I had, because I'd been having Braxton Hicks. So I thought it was just Braxton Hicks. So I was a bit uncomfortable and I kept moving and sort of going, oh, this is uncomfortable. Got up, went to the toilet, came back to bed and lay down and then shot straight back up and my waters broke everywhere. They tell you, like the midwives go, oh, it doesn't happen like it does in the movies. Honestly, I was sitting on a lake and my husband was get off the bed um, <laughs> with an expletive in between there. <laughs> Um, and I went from naught to a hundred immediately. So I was having contractions a minute apart and a minute long immediately. It was very, very rapid, very, very scary, very fast. He called for an ambulance and they said, can you drive her? Because we'll, you'll get her to the hospital quicker because I'm in a rural area as well. So that meant that obviously there's a bit of a wait for those sorts of things. And so we drove along to the hospital and I was timing my contractions in the car and trying to like stay calm <laughs> and trying not to panic my poor husband. So we got to the hospital at seven o'clock. I was one centimeter at 730. I was four centimeters and at nine o'clock he was born. Oh gosh, it was rapid. It was very, very fast, quite scary. All this time we don't have a birth plan. So the like I, after he was born, I had a minor little tear and they were getting ready to like stitch me and they were going to inject me with anesthetic that wasn't going to work <laughs> to stitch me up. And I was like, no, 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 no. So I'm having to like, I've just given birth. I'm breastfeeding my newborn baby and I'm having to like sort of go, no, 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 please don't inject me with that anesthetic. That won't work. Please, you know, you need to just do it and I'll just breathe through it and I'll have to you know, get through it. And they're all standing there sort of staring at me, you know, mouths open while I'm being sewn shut with no pain release. But I can tell you that oxytocin is wonderful pain relief. So having my newborn baby on my chest <laughs> after having given birth, there was a lot of oxytocin going on right then. It was, I mean, it was a very, very, very busy delivery room because they were expecting to have a very poorly baby. Um, you know, an early fast labor. And so they were ready to whisk him off into neonatal intensive care or NICU. We call it NICU. I think you call it NICU, don't you? Yes. <laughs> so yeah, into NICU and he was fine. So I had this monster premature baby. So he was six pounds, four ounces. You work in pounds and ounces, don't you? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so he was 
Yeah, so he was massive. For 35 weeks, he was a big boy and he scored 10 on his app guard. So he was absolutely fine. And he latched immediately to breastfeeding, you know, all absolutely fine. So a lot of it's a bit of a blur. And the way that I was, I had to do a lot of self-advocating and doing what felt comfortable for me. So I, you know, I did things like bouncing my ball. Obviously, there was no time for any kind of pain relief or anything beyond a little bit of gas and air, which... You know, it worked fine. It was so fast, I didn't even have time to think about it, to be honest. But the issue was, is obviously because I didn't have a birth plan, a lot of that information that they needed, I had to regurgitate while I was very occupied with another job that I was trying to do at that time. (laughs) That's the thing is the birth plan is used here in the US, but it's kind of sporadic. And even if you have one, they kind of look down on it. Or, you know, some doctors are like, you don't need that. We kind of have to advocate for one. So that's, that's a big difference there. Yeah, no, it's, it's a standard process here. Um, obviously, things don't go to plan. I mean, childbirth is still one of the most dangerous things that we will do as women. The biggest killer of women of you know, sort of birth, you know, childbearing age. It's a, it's a dangerous thing to do, but it is standard that it's part of the process. And things like, yeah, you know, just like music and like candlelight and whether you want the lights on and they do things like that. I would have loved to have had a birthing pool, but because I was high risk, I wouldn't have been allowed that anyway. So there are certain things that I wouldn't have been able to have. But if it hadn't been so fast, I'd probably, you know, I would have liked to have chosen the music that he came into the world to. But there was no time to even think about that. <laughs> you said you had to advocate for yourself in some ways. Do you think that was just to the fact that his birth was so fast or was your disability a factor in that? It was the, it was the disability as well. For example, obviously... You know, modern birthing practices and knowledge and things like that have changed slightly. You know, the the whole feet in the stirrups and those sorts of things. We now know that being on all fours is a more natural and stable way to give birth. But obviously, from my point of view, I couldn't weight bear on my hands. And so, you know, there were times when they would be like, oh, you might find this more comfortable. And I'd be like, nope, (laughs) that's not going to work. I'm going to have to go the slightly more awkward route because it's just, yeah, I'm not going to have the strength to be able to do that. So, for example, because of my Ellis Danos, um, cannulating me is really difficult. So the midwives didn't want to cannulate me. So they called for the anaesthetist to come and do my cannula. And he came after my son was born, uh, which was great because no big nasty bruises in my hands. Thank you very much. And I was very happy <laughs> with that. But it was it's things like that where they were, you know, they were very good at listening But obviously, because it was such a rapid and frantic situation that, you know, it's like it's like being sort of as a freight train. It's going. There's nothing you can do to stop it. You've just got to embrace it and go with it. (laughs) It was it was happening whether, you know, I wanted to to or not. And they weren't going to be able to stop it either. I remember the point where so when I was um, only one centimeter, they were very much like, because it's premature, it might actually stop, it might stall or it might progress. So I was left by the midwives with my husband and half an hour later, I said to him, and I'm pretty sure this is happening. Um, Can you you get a midwife for me? Um, And she looked and she was like, oh no, I'm sure it's fine. And she looked at me, she said, oh, you're four centimeters now. (laughs) I was like, right, better get you into the birthing suite because it had gone much, much faster. And actually I saw that same midwife because she went off shift. Um, before he was born and I saw her that that night the same night and she came and saw me and she looked at my notes and she was like I thought you'd be fast but I didn't think you'd be that fast <laughs> it's definitely you know th- I suppose the the thing about advocating for yourself is that you're advocating for yourself and for your child at the same time and there wasn't anything that happened that I wasn't happy with in the end you know everyone respected my wishes I got the sutures that I needed, but I did have to tell them, you know, like I remember being like, oh, I want to do skin to skin and he's crowning and I'm taking my clothes off. <laughs> bit, bit awkward, um, but they were, they were brilliant, but it was a lot of me having to be very firm. So, you know, like the whole thing with the anesthetic, for example, why are you stabbing me to stab me again? And I'm just going to feel it again you know it's like I don't want to be injected with anesthetic that isn't going to work and you can see their faces because they sort of just go this is nuts you know this is really you know people don't have stitches in their vulva after having given birth without any sort of pain relief (laughs) um that's 
not how we do things. And I was just like, no, I, but yeah, I'm not going to put something in me that's not going to work. And they did listen, to be fair, to them. So it was good. And you said in the short amount of time you were able to get the gas. That's something that's starting to become a thing, I think, here, but it's not as widespread. Is that something that's available most places there? Oh, 100%. So gas and air has been standard as pain relief during pregnancy since I was born, since before I was born. So my mum had it when she was in labour with me and it's really, really common. It's actually used as pain relief for surgery as well. It is used freely. I mean, every single birthing suite has got it rigged up to the, it's literally part of the system. So it's it's really, really normal for us to do that. Medicalised birth is far less common here. I mean, it's still common, but we have a lot less intervention. I think it's part of the midwife-led sort of care rather than doctor-led care. Yeah, midwives are much more woman-centric and they tend to work more. They see hundreds and hundreds of babies born and they care for you throughout the whole pregnancy. So they, you know, they, they're the experts in a way that a consultant who sees you for five minutes and then suddenly sees you at the point that your baby is born it's not in the same way I think it's a very very different sort of way of working here what would a typical middle of the pregnancy low risk appointment look like with a midwife really simple so normally you have obviously measurements taken weight and all of those sorts of things they'll do a urine sample at every single as the amount of time they peed in a pot ever and that's <laughs> that's standard for every pregnancy root low risk or high risk and they'll do like sort of the measurements of the bump so that they see that that's progressing well they do blood tests at every appointment normally uh, regardless of whether you're high risk or low risk and you'll have your blood pressure taken and they'll just talk to you as well i mean that's the the biggest thing is about having someone because quite often the midwife that you see through your appointments will be the midwife that delivers your baby as well. So the thing with having care from local midwives and the local hospitals means that you will very likely see a similar midwife. Like a friend of mine had a home birth for her baby and the midwives that she saw were the midwives that you know, came to her home and delivered her son with her. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of continuity of care throughout the whole thing. Um, Mostly it'll be about sort of how things are progressing and if there are any issues and, you know, like if you're having any UTI symptoms or any of those sorts of things or thrush, you know, all of those things. But also they are all trained in mental health care for pregnancy um, and they will be watching like hawks for any signs of prenatal um, depression or anything like that and then postnatal stuff as well and they also see you after you've had your baby born as well so so i know in the u.s one they're not i don't think they're trained in mental health issues but also our appointments are like five to ten minutes and you're out the door um so is how long are the appointments there you'll probably be at your appointments for about half an hour but you wouldn't necessarily be in with your midwife for that whole time so you might sort of go into your midwife and then you might go to phlebotomy and go and have your bloods done or you know sort of you can sort of go back and forth within the unit it does vary I mean they will have five minute appointments as well and <laughs> you know it's it depends on the appointment that you're having because there are obviously some that are more significant than others so like your birth plan appointment is going to be longer and you'll do your birth plan with your midwife normally obviously I don't know because I never got one <laughs> I don't even know exactly how that works. It was quite funny because I did get a reminder about my appointment and I was like, I'm in hospital with my newborn baby. <laughs> He's here. <laughs> uh, won't be coming to see you. Sorry. So, yeah, so they definitely, there will be five minute appointments and then there are longer appointments and it depends on, it's like the, yeah, like the 20 week scans and those sorts of things and they'll go through that sort of stuff so they go through those with you and yeah if there are any concerns and that sort of stuff they'll always raise it for you and you can have extra appointments they are really good if you are worried about movements or anything if anything feels wrong you just go to your birthing unit and they will scan you they will listen they will do you know they do the fetal doppler so they always listen for heartbeat every time and they'll do all of those things and they're really um they would always rather see you than not see you like that's they are adamant that anything feels wrong you just go straight in and you don't have to make an appointment you just go straight in. right after your son was born what was the post type of care in the hospital like so the maternity unit was one where you're sort of for 
four beds to a bay basically so you're in bays with your babies and with other women that have also just given birth so you're not in private rooms unless you pay for a private room um there are private rooms but they tend to be used for people that are really poorly and need a lot more monitoring or you know so someone who's just by after cesarean or those sorts of things so they prioritize those things they try and get most people home the same day or the day after so you don't have normally a long hospital stay postnatally and the same with babies. So the other thing is that we don't have nurseries. So your baby stays with you. So you do not have, you know, your baby isn't taken away as standard. Mine was, but that's a different, that's a different part of the story. <laughs> um, but generally, you know, you have your base set up with your bed for the mum. There's normally a chair bed for partner or someone else to stay with you who's also allowed to stay on the ward as well and then you have your cot next to your bed with you know with your baby in and you're allowed to have your baby with you for the whole time they don't take it off you unless it's for testing and things like that and so initially my son was born thriving he was doing really really well and they were all sort of going on about this 35 weeker who'd escaped NICU <laughs> famous last word <laughs> So he came up onto the ward with me um, and that was about four hours after I'd given birth. So we were left initially, just the three of us to be in the birthing suite on our own. You know, and if we needed to have speech to the midwife, we could, my husband could go and get one, we could pull the cord. But, you know, we were left to our own devices. They have, um, they had a bathroom in there with a big bath. And so I was run a bath so that I could have a, a wash in the bath and all of that sort of stuff and they were you know it's really gentle they don't rush you straight out of the door um they do afterwards but the initial bit you know they we were left to be quite sort of trying devices with our new baby and then you're taken up onto the ward he was doing really well he was feeding he latched immediately i had intended to breastfeed for a number of reasons but a lot of it was to do with actually being disabled because the idea of having to cart bottles and everything around with me and having to do all of the prep and all of that sort of stuff when I just had this sort of factory on me just felt like that was the more <laughs> more practical option and would involve less getting up and down and all of those things. Yeah, portable feeding, you know, you've got it right there in front of you, so it made more sense to me. Um, and I was really chuffed that he was doing well and it was great. And then they do um, blood tests for babies after they're born especially premature babies so he was having like heel pricks to check for his blood sugar levels and unfortunately he ended up being hypoglycemic so his blood sugar levels uh, were dropping and he was getting a bit poorly so they did another test and then they decided he was too poorly and he needed to go to NICU which was awful I you know there's no <laughs> having your baby taken away from you especially when physically you've just been through the birth and so you're not particularly mobile yet and you know I wasn't particularly mobile anyway was you know obviously awful and my husband went down with him and I was left on the ward with other mothers and their new babies so their babies were all crying and I'm going oh my god where's my baby <laughs> so that was not not great and then because obviously he'd only just been born my milk hadn't come in they tried bottle feeding him in the NICU but he couldn't breathe at the same time as having a bottle so his oxygen levels would drop so they had to put an NG tube in um, and feed him with an NG tube which obviously is pretty brutal to see with a tiny little baby having you know uh, an NG tube and I was still on the ward so I hadn't I didn't see any of this my husband saw all of this myself uh, whereas I was up on the ward um, unable really to move and you know feeling like I'd been hit by a bus because that's what it's like after you've given birth <laughs> I don't think anybody you know it might have been fast but it's still you know it's still pretty eventful in terms of you know your body and my hips were obviously really uncomfortable and obviously everything had shifted quite dramatically and the one thing that I think was lacking and I think this is common throughout careful women across the world I don't think it's unique to the UK was the um, pain relief and the frequency of pain relief or the type of pain relief that they would allow me to have or where you know and bearing in mind that obviously I'm used to having significant pain relief <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're like, here's 200 milligrams of paracetamol. <laughs> and you're like, well, that's not going to cut 
the mustard. You know, you'd be waiting, and they were supposed, to, and they were strict about you know timings and all of those things. Obviously, you know, they don't want any accidental overdoses, but it's still, you know, it's quite difficult, especially if you're unable to get out and go and walk around yourself. At that point, I didn't have my wheelchair with me in hospital because we'd obviously come into hospital not really expecting necessarily to have a baby <laughs> when we came in in the morning. So by the afternoon, we had a baby, but I didn't have my chair with me. My husband hadn't been home. So I wasn't really able to get up and get out and do things. And the midwives were brilliant, but they weren't really kind of aware of how physically limited I was at that point and I think I probably was so exhausted that I wasn't necessarily able to communicate that effectively either so I I don't think it was entirely their fault but at the same time I think that there were times when I probably would have needed support to get out of bed and you know go and see my son but I wasn't able to do so because they're so they were understaffed and under-resourced and no one would seem to be particularly bothered about helping me to do those things so my husband had to do it and then obviously he had to go home because he had other things to do as well and to bring stuff in for us because obviously we didn't have anything with us (laughs) because we hadn't planned on having a baby and then that uh the next day um I basically spent the whole day down in the NICU my husband brought my wheelchair for me and I became the wheelchair mum so I would just be referred to again we become inanimate objects don't we (laughs) we're not people we're just the one in the wheelchair and the problem was is that you know again you know it's a hospital it should be pretty accessible but it's an old building and things like you know like the doors to the maternity unit obviously because of security and making sure that no one snatches any babies you know because those things happen you have to be buzzed in but obviously I can't then open the door and they can't see me because obviously they're big heavy fire doors and I'm obviously down low so they can't see that I'm there um, and so there was a lot of slightly humiliating having to sort of be like, hey, you know, like waving and like, not, but, you know, sort of asking other people to help me. I'm pretty good at that now, but it's quite exhausting when you are in a place where you would have thought that people in wheelchairs are not completely abnormal. Um, <laughs> you know, it's hospital. Yeah, let's yeah, um, say, especially in a hospital. Yeah, exactly. So you would have thought they might be a little bit better equipped to deal with that, but they weren't. And the NICU was on a different floor. So I had to sort of go in a lift and, you know, all of those things as well. So it's a bit of a trip to get down there. And I basically just camped out in the NICU with my son. I was, you know, I went up to bed for like four hours every night and then that was it. And I just stayed there with him. And he ended up being more poorly. So he had, they did his gas test, which is the test for bilirubin levels. So um, for jaundice. And he was above the transfusion line. So he was very, very poorly and ended up being a little baby Smurf in his little incubator with like the eye mask and blue lights and all of those things. And what had started as a relatively healthy sort of 35 weeker turned into a two week NICU stay where he ended up with an infection and a couple of other bits and pieces. And fortunately, I didn't have to go home. So this is the other thing that I think, you know, with the NHS wouldn't necessarily be possible um, if you're paying for these things. You know, I was able to stay with him the whole time. So I had my room up on the ward and then they moved me into a private room because I didn't have my baby with me and I didn't have to pay for it because I was basically, I was distraught because I had all these babies crying around me and my baby was poorly downstairs and I couldn't, and you know, it was just torture. You know, you do, it was really... You know, emotionally, it was really, really hard. And they fortunately were really good with that. And it turned into, you know, they, I became sort of like recognized by everybody. All the staff knew who I was because obviously I, re- I stick out like a sore thumb, you know, <laughs> the mum in the wheelchair. The NICU staff were phenomenal. Absolutely. Like the nurses and the doctors in there were just, unbelievable they were so so caring but also determined that I if I wanted to breastfeed him then they would help me breastfeed him and they were all trained in lactation support so all of the nurses knew how to get people pumping you had to do all of those things how and I had literally at one point I had a nurse giving him a tube feed of my pumped milk while I was putting him to the breast so that he would associate food with being at the breast 
just like heroes, absolute heroes. They were amazing and they were a big factor in why we succeeded in breastfeeding. But the from the disability care point of view, I think the the one bit that did happen was that at one point they did try to discharge me. And at this point I was still staying up on the maternity ward. And I said, you yeah, know, he's just started breastfeeding. I can't go home. I've got to feed him every two hours. I can't drive because I'm disabled. <laughs> yeah, I'm a 40 minute drive away anyway. So I can't go in and out myself. I'll need other people to support me doing that. There's nowhere else that I can stay. And they actually have rooms in the NICU for parents to stay in. And they're normally for parents to stay in if their child is very, very poorly and potentially not going to be coming home or for, for when your child is due to be discharged they get you to stay there a couple of nights especially if your baby's coming home on oxygen or any of those sorts of things so that they can make sure that you know what you're doing and that you can look after your baby overnight so they put the baby in there with you before you get discharged but you're still monitored by the NICU nurses and doctors so they fortunately had one of those free so I basically went in there and I didn't go home until he came home so and I don't think that would have happened had I not been a wheelchair user. That was definitely to do with my being disabled. I think they looked at me and they went, hmm, we need to support her in a different way. And she needs you know, us to look after her in that way. And again, I don't know if that would be standard. I think it was definitely more to do with my disability and me being a wheelchair user. I think they realized that, that they were asking something that was slightly unreasonable of me. <laughs> <laughs> basically that I wouldn't be capable of you know sort of getting in every two hours to somehow feed my baby <laughs> overnight <laughs> and they wanted him to come home as much as I did you know because obviously the other thing that I think is interesting is that although we don't directly pay the costs ourselves individually you know it still costs that much to run a hospital I mean not quite as much because they're not making a profit in the same way that you at the US healthcare system is and the but Certainly, you know, it still costs, you know, thousands of pounds for a, a hospital to, you know, support you through childbirth and having a poorly baby. You know, it still costs the NHS thousands and thousands of pounds. It's just that it's paid for in a different way. I know that sometimes with people with a C-section or things like that that happen are in wheelchairs on occasion. But how was getting around the NICU in a wheelchair? How does that Generally, it was good. It was lucky, really, because it was a modern building. So it had been built specifically in, I think it was about, only about five, ten years before we were in there. And it was built by Dyson as well. So it was all funded by Dyson. And so it was very modern. It's very beautiful. It's like all wood clad and very, very zen, <laughs> very peaceful. Uh, but it had been built to all modern building control standards. So we have quite strict building control standards now so things like you know like door width openings and all that sort of stuff are all standardized to you know make sure that they're accessible and there are accessible height sinks I was able to wash my hands no problem and I've washed my hands a lot <laughs> um, you do a lot of hand washing when you've got a poorly baby in NICU so there's a lot of that um, but all of that was accessible they had a, they had a disabled toilet on the NICU so that was all fine the room that we had was a wheelchair accessible room as well so that obviously one of the rooms that they did that they built as part of the NICU suite did have a, so it was a walk-in so it was a wet room shower and all of those sorts of things so it was all geared up to support a disabled parent which was unusual I mean they didn't have anything like hoists or any of those sorts of things but I'm sure that they would have borrowed it from the hospital from another bit of the hospital if they needed to base was really good I think the only issue that I had is that obviously I come with my own chair <laughs> so and hospital chairs especially like seem to be like these like boats that people sit in like they're just like these massive padded wooden heavy chairs you know all of the cot baits are set up with those chairs and obviously I can get in out of my chair. I'm an ambulatory wheelchair user. So it wasn't a huge problem for me, but I could see how if you were using your wheelchair and that was the only way that you were able to get around and you weren't able to get out of your chair without obviously a lot of assistance, then that would be quite a challenge because it's all built around these big items of furniture and these bays that are set up for those things. 
Um, and the wheelchair who does get in the way with those things. What was going home and getting settled in as parents like? So, I mean, the funny thing was is that obviously because he'd been in NICU, he was on a routine. And we were really excited because we had this baby that slept in a cot and <laughs> fed every three hours and slept. It was lovely. And we were like, this is amazing. They've done it all for us. <laughs> We've got this sort of routine and very easy baby. But obviously, as soon as he came out of NICU, he woke up because he was better because he wasn't poorly anymore. And he was just a, an average sort of 37 week baby there were things that were easy I mean they were really good for discharge it was very straightforward they just make sure that obviously the car seat set up properly and that he could sit in so they do the test to make sure that his oxygen levels didn't drop when he was in the car seat um they do that with all preemies basically just to make sure that he was okay and his head positioning was all right because obviously they're a little bit small for car seats so they're not made for the ones that sometimes they need extra cushioning and extra bits and pieces to support their heads he was fine and we finally you know got discharged so the following friday so he was born on the sunday and then it was two weeks on friday that he was discharged we came home and i had one of those side sleeper cot because i knew that i wanted to breastfeed but i also knew that i couldn't reach down and lift him out of a traditional cot um because of my ads i wouldn't have been able to do it even though he was pretty light as babies go it's still you know more than I was able to do and obviously the bending over as well is obviously not good with the pots as well so we had prepared for having a side sleeper and he would sleep in there and we would sleep in bed and that became a furniture like a closed storage device really quickly we ended up co-sleeping um, and it's quite interesting because the that's another thing that's quite a big difference between the UK and the US co-sleeping is quite common in the UK and it's actually you are told by your midwives and there's a company called the, there's a charity called the Lullaby Trust that teach you about the safe sleep seven and how to co-sleep safely. And it is quite a standard thing over here. I know that there's a lot of people are very nervous of doing that in the US. I'm trying to sort of find the right words, how, how to describe it. From the perspective of someone who was breastfeeding, as long as you, you know, there are things that you can follow that make it safe to do if you look at the data on things like on co-sleeping in countries like india for example where they almost always co-sleep the instances of cot death and things like that are almost zero due to co-sleeping it's unsafe co-sleeping that is risk factor and i really strongly recommend that anyone is listening to this especially if, you know being in the us have a look at the lullaby, lullaby trust website because i know that a lot of people accidentally co-sleep and that's the thing that's the most dangerous thing is that things like covers and pillows and things like that and falling asleep while you're feeding your baby are the things that are most dangerous. So if you prepare to co-sleep safely, even if you never fully intend to, that is far safer than accidentally ending up co-sleeping. So definitely have a look at the, the Lullaby Trust's website because it gives you all of the details on how to do that. But also from a physical disability point of view, it was perfect because obviously when you've got a tiny baby who is constantly waking up and that sort of stuff, you are, I mean, there is another, you're in another realm of fatigue. It's not, <laughs> you know, if you see, if you thought you had chronic fatigue before, and you're now on a completely different level. And that was what happened to me was that I ended up having a small baby who basically was catching up because he was, you know, because he was premature. He woke up every 45 minutes and was constantly feeding and he was just, attached to me permanently and it was much easier to sort of wake up let him latch on let him fall back to sleep unlatch him and go back to sleep myself then have to get up every time get him out of a cot feed him sit up to feed him I you know mastered the art of lying down to breastfeed quite quickly which if you're able to do so I highly rate it <laughs> because <laughs> um, it's wonderful because I think you you just end up sort of not having to try anywhere near as hard it's great and it definitely was something that I think helped with the physical aspect of having to you know look after and feed a newborn was the fact that I could literally if I wanted to stay in bed all day with my baby <laughs> and it was just wonderful you know and it was actually a really precious time because we had this opportunity to 
you know, really bond and just be together. Um, and that obviously is part of having paid maternity leave. The way that my, you know, I was employed at the time, I'm self-employed now, so it's slightly different, but the way that it worked was that I had six weeks at 90% pay. And then I had a further, um, I think it was 10 months, uh, statutory maternity pay which worked out at about sort of I can't remember what it was exactly but it I think it was about 40 percent of my pay which was fine that's a perfectly reasonable amount to live on at that point anyway cost of living crisis maybe not so much now <laughs> but most people will take all of or the majority of their maternity leave and we have a year basically maternity leave which I know is almost unheard of in the U.S. <laughs> It's very different. <laughs> yeah, I think Sorry. standard six weeks and you might get paid for it. And then others are up to maybe 12, but that's about it. I mean, I honestly, I don't know how I would have survived with, and I certainly wouldn't have had a successful breastfeeding journey, you know, like having to go to back to work that quickly. I don't know how anyone would be able to do that. It's so unbelievable. And you think, you know, these, these families, the dyad, you know, the, the pairing of a mother and a child needs to, you know, be together. And it's just, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, it is a very different culture. Gosh, I hope it changes for you guys because uh, <laughs> that's, I can't imagine it. But it also helped with my recovery as well because obviously physically, um, I did things that I think a lot of people do standard with having a baby, but I made decisions that were based on being disabled. So I, I wore him all the time. So I used uh, a stretchy wrap a sling, um, and I would tie it on me in the morning and I would just lift him in and out of it all day. So I would wear him on me so I didn't have to keep lifting him with my arms and he loved it he loved being a little cocooned in me and I've got photographs of like me sewing with my sewing machine while he was in the wrap and all of those sorts of things like go on dog walks with him in the wrap and you know that was really wonderful um and obviously it was a lot easier to carry him when I was in the chair as well so I would have him in the wrap and my husband would push my wheelchair or I would even self-propel with him in a wrap on my chest so that was really great. Obviously, once he got a little bit heavier, it did become more difficult, to be fair. <laughs> Things like, you know, having to find a pushchair that will fit in the car with a wheelchair as well. So our cars are a lot smaller than US cars <laughs> as standard. You know, we, we don't have these massive, I mean, honestly, I think there's been some pictures recently of like a standard like US like truck compared to like the UK version. And it's like, a mother and baby like it's ridiculous <laughs> granted we also have smaller parking spaces so yeah if you try and drive an american car over here it's really difficult um but it means that like storage space is quite limited so we have a relatively small car and so finding a push chair that would fit in with the wheelchair as well is really really difficult and so there's there's a few things i did and i also i would have liked to have done something a little bit more eco-friendly with nappies for example but something had to give and that was one of the things that I decided that due to my fatigue and those things that it was all right for me to just use biodegradable nappies instead <laughs> um you yeah, know and it's things like that that I think I would have liked to have done some things a little bit differently but I had to sort of go what's the trade-off with my physical health as well as you know sort of being the you know, eco earth mother that we, you know, that I would have loved to have been. <laughs> so I know most of most of the people that I interview, their partners are able bodied. Is your was your husband able bodied as well? Yes. So he's non disabled. He is generally. I mean, he's he's a superstar. I like he's an incredible man. Very very uh, fortunate. We. Obviously, he's gone from having, yeah, because we were together when we were 17. He's, I've known him since I was 11. He was in the year above me at school. So he's known me as well, as fit and able and non-disabled myself. Um, although technically I probably, you know, I obviously had symptoms then. Um, they weren't disabling symptoms at that point. So he has seen me go from that to being, you know, in a wheelchair, which I think is quite a big adjustment. But he always just worries about me more than, you know, he's not he's not worried about me being disabled. He's just worried about making sure that I'm okay. And that is always his priority. And that's one of the things about having the wheelchair that made a huge difference because 
he no longer has to check if I'm all right, if I've overdone it. You know, if we, we, I don't use it all the time. I use it primarily for sort of if we're going to be out all day so that I can manage my spoons as the <laughs> common phrase, but we'll use it. So we went out a couple of weekends ago to a place called Bewley, um, which I know that an American is going to butcher the pronunciation of <laughs> because it's spelled B A U. L I E U. Um, so uh, it's called Bewley, but I think it would probably come out as Bowley um, <laughs> if you were reading it as an American. So it's a beautiful place. It's a beautiful stately home in the New Forest, um, and they have a car museum. And so we went there for the day, and I was able to do the full day because I was in my wheelchair. He is so used to now you know like there are bits that I can't self-propel and he'd forgotten my power the bit that attaches my power add on which was not great um so we had to so I self-propelled for most of the day but there were bits that I couldn't do and we have this kind of shorthand I don't even have to ask him now he knows when I'm going to need help he knows he can look at the terrain he's looking out for the obstacles he knows when I might need a little bit of assistance because obviously I hate having anyone push me certainly not without my permission or me asking first um it's uh well it gives me the heebie-jeebies it makes me very cross but he's very good now at respecting that boundary and we've you know in a way despite the fact that he's not in a wheelchair we've become wheelchair users together because he's the one that sort of is with me when I'm using it and we've had to sort of work out how to use it and how it works and how to navigate together and he's really good at listening and advocating for me as well so I guess the last little bit would be do you have any advice or resources for people with disabilities that maybe or pointers that you advise during that pregnancy and birth I think the my one biggest advice is to, if you have any desires about how you want your birth to go, write them down before 35 weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just have them somewhere or make sure at least that the person who is most likely to be your birth partner, whether that's your partner or a family member, has that information, even if the medical people don't. Because having to do that in the moment it's quite scary actually you need to have that information down and if you've just got it in your head and you haven't had that conversation it's it's worth doing that early I also definitely recommend as I've said about looking at the lullaby trust because I think that you know lives could be saved by people you know sort of practicing safe co-sleeping um and I know that a lot of people do it secretly and do it you know and especially like in the U.S. do it secretly therefore you're more likely to have an accident or something could happen so educate yourself and know and prepare to do it even if you never fully never actually intend to do so and finally I would also say that the biggest thing that helped me and I was able to do this and I was in an immense area of privilege um, because I had the support and I had the resources to be able to do this so I do say this knowing that I come from an, a, a pro privileged position is to just go with it (laughs) the worst thing that I did when especially after my son was born was to try and fight against his natural instincts and what he needed and try and make him fit in with what I thought was the right way you know of a routine and all of those sorts of things and as soon as I just gave into it and followed his lead we all were a lot happier (laughs) so if it's not working after five minutes stop do something else come back to it you know especially when it comes to sleep so you know if you're trying to make your child go to sleep when they're not ready to go to sleep it is torture so just don't (laughs) Um, if you can because again I know that you know I had the full maternity leave and I had the support and those sorts of things that I know a lot of people don't have access to those things but the more you lean into what they need it becomes a lot easier to sort of go with the flow on that 
and get a stretchy wrap, especially if you're a wheelchair user. Um, I find that I found a stretchy, especially when they were tiny, when he was tiny, much easier than a structured wrap. But also it meant that from a access perspective, I could put it on once and then take it off at the end of the day. Whereas with something like with the buckles and things like that, obviously like with dexterity, it's much harder to do. Um, so I found it much easier to just have the wrap on ready to go and then you just put him in put him out and it's yeah definitely a brilliant investment i hope someone yeah i hope it was interesting and i hope that people get something from it because i think that one of the things that i want to sort of advocate for is that disabled people are parents too you know we are you know it's it's something you know it happened the other week on one of our i don't know if you get this um like on facebook we have these like sort of local groups that are from like your town's group that where people can put up sort of notices and things and someone put up a post complaining about a disabled person parking in a parent and child bay in a supermarket so we have disabled bays and we have parent and child bays and i was like disabled people are parents too <laughs> you know it's it, and and funnily enough she deleted her comment <laughs> because i think she suddenly went oh no of course they are <laughs> but you know if there isn't visibility and we're not out there doing things then i suppose you know if you if you can't see it you can't be it right thank you for coming on and sharing your story thank you so much Kelsey. Thank you for listening and feel free to email me if you have any questions or would like to be featured on the podcast at disabledbirthstories at gmail.com.